So what's more difficult, being the CEO of a billion dollar company or being the CEO of your own household? <laughs> so I'm the chief operating officer, my wife is the CEO. Smart man, been married 20 years. <laughs> I see that, I'm taking notes on that one guy. Guy Lawrence, welcome to Every Conversation Counts. Thank you very much, nice to see you. Uh, nice to see you too. Now, what did you think when we pitched you on this idea to talk about uh, the most important conversations in building relationships? Why did you want to be a part of a project like this? Um, well, to be honest, I didn't. You told me I had to be. <laughs> oh, and I have all the power on this side, right? That's how it works. Uh, I think the other thing is, is that the, um, the power of conversations is really underestimated in business. People talk about you know, having an MBA or going to the right university or having the right contacts or networks and uh, some of that is true um, but actually the power of a conversation and the ab ability to lead um, and use conversations in leading is uh, probably the most important thing I think in leadership these days. You know conversations and impression management so valuable and when we look at someone in your role whether it's working with employees, working with clients, production crews, what is the number one thing that impresses you most when you are meeting someone for the very first time? Um, integrity and brevity. So people who just waffle on about stuff and you have no idea what they're trying to tell you or they're kind of mentioning big people's names and all these kinds of things that I just, you know, I'm not interested. What, what I'm really interested in is what are you trying to tell me and do you say it with integrity and, and, and can you say it in, you know, a relatively uh, modest way rather than going on forever. What's the mantra, what's the philosophy of how you make every conversation count? Well, I think every conversation starts with um, listening to what people want to say on a topic. Uh, um, so, to me, there's no good conversation if you're not listening. And is that the biggest pitfall within the conversations you see, employees, executive team, clients, that there's just a lack of listening out there? Yeah. I think it's the biggest efficiency in business today. You've been here for about a year and a half. You've listened to this company. You've changed this company. What would you say is the most important conversation you've had here as the CEO of Rogers Communications? Um, I've, the most important conversation was the conversation with thousands of the staff in the first few months to listen and understand the DNA of the business. Um, you know, that was, that was the foundation of, of everything I'm doing was that, was that conversation. But it was a conversation not with one person, it was a conversation with literally thousands of people. The, um, the interesting, one of the interesting things I did is I took the top 80 people in the company and I also took another 70 people externally and um, I gave them the seven questions um, and I gave them an hour and I basically said I'm going to write notes and I'm going to ask questions if I need clarifications but I'm not going to actually talk and um, it, people, it freaked a lot of people out I have to tell you. Um, uh, internally people came into the room and they'd say uh, uh, the first sentence and then they'd look at me and I'd go keep going and, <laughs> and I'd just sit there and write notes and I wrote two um, 250 notebooks, I filled two 250 page notebooks with those conversations. You know people were just shocked at how little I wanted to talk and how much I did actually want to listen. And because you create a void, because if you're not willing to talk and they're not, you know, they don't, the silence creates a necessity to talk, then people actually open up more. And you get more and more information and the more they've said, they feel even more comfortable saying and so you really get the full picture very quickly. How much of leadership is listening given what you just said? Um, well, actually, uh, if you look at any decision, basically you have to understand the, 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 the situation first. Um, then you have to um, listen to what the uh, options are to do, some, to, to, to do something with the situation and then you have to make a decision um, based on either a recommendation they give you or just on what you've heard, right? So the listening component of all of that is really 90% and the decision making bit uh, because the way you process information actually happens very quickly. So in reality listening is most of the conversation for me. You've made a lot of change and you've brought in some key players to facilitate that change. When you talk about listening and trust, what's the key question you ask for the people you choose to put in place to help you achieve that change? So the way I do interviews is slightly different to um, a lot of other people I know. So the first thing I do is I take, I've got all the background on their resume, you know, character assessments, personality assessment, all this stuff. And basically I just put that to one side 
And I start and I say to them, tell me about your, uh, your childhood. Tell me about whether you've got brothers and sisters. What did your parents do for a living? Did you own a parrot when you were a child? Do you have a dog? Where do you go on holidays? Do you have uh, a husband, a wife, kids? Do there are? And I spend 20 minutes asking them about that. And I ask them about what happened. You know, they'll say, oh, we, we moved from Wisconsin to Detroit or whatever. And I'll say, well, how did you feel about that at the time and all the rest of it? And what happens is, is people think it's a strange way to start an interview. Um, and therefore, they're usually a little bit guarded. But then, and they're desperate to get into their resume. So they're desperate to say, and then I went to university and I got this job. And I always say, no, no, forget that. Just go, let's go back. Where did you go on holiday? And then people start talking about it. And they, there's, you know, one guy uh, I met, uh, for instance, his father passed away when he was a kid. And he had to become the kind of dad of the family. And so he had to grow up very quickly. Um, and that shaped him. And, and, and so I, I focus all around that. And um, you can put anything on a resume. And we can research it anyway so we know if it's the truth or it's not the truth. So having got the personal stuff done, we quickly talk through the resume. Then I move on to next, how do you lead people? And why should people be led by you? That's always a very interesting question. Why should people be led by you? And um, it usually is, people are usually very well versed in how to describe a job they've done in their career. They're usually not very well versed in how to answer that question. The idea of leadership, why should people be led by Guy Lawrence? Ah, now, but if I tell you that, you see, and then it goes out on the web, then when every time I interview somebody else, they're going to quote that back at me. Just so help it, everybody I'm just, No, I'm just not going to tell you. That's the secret. No. That's the secret sauce. No, I'm just sauce not going to tell you. That's the secret sauce. A I taste. Can't. No, no, it's top secret. An appetizer. No, it's not going to happen. Nothing. <laughs> we'll let them figure that out. I tried for you. I tried. But probably the most important thing about NHL was learning to work together. That the sum of us working together as one Rogers is bigger than us working individually. Being an employee of the company and watching the way you execute a town hall meeting, it honestly feels like it's a WWE match. You create the experience <laughs> of people coming to an event. Now, when we talk about conversations of getting across priorities, how do you approach any given presentation to make sure the message is heard? A presentation is a conversation with a wider group of people. That's, that's what a presentation is. Um, and my view is, is if a 12-year-old child doesn't understand what you're about to say, then there's no point in presenting it to very senior people or even very junior people. So you have to simplify down exactly what it is you're trying to get across. And therefore, I always have a 12-year-old in my mind when I'm presenting. Uh, the other thing is, is you ask a lot of people, you ask thousands of people to give up half of their day to come and listen to you you better damn well entertain them. And I don't mean in a vacuous way, but I mean I think the importance of humour, um, the importance of emphasising the fact you've listened to their point of view is very important because otherwise you can present and simplify it down and get your point across, but if they're, if they're sat there going, why did I have to give up half a day to come to do this, you've lost. Do you ever get nervous? Oh yeah, I think, um, I, I think if you don't get nervous, then it shows a touch of arrogance, too much arrogance. So um, I, I have quite a relaxed style, but, but I never go into a situa situation where I haven't decided exactly what I'm going to say and how I'm going to position it. And, um, and therefore, my nervousness is 24 hours beforehand. When I, once I wake up on the day of the event, I'm not nervous. I'm an automatic, probably like yourself, every day. <laughs> and I literally come in and then deliver what I... And I never deviate from what I've rehearsed, never. Who would you say has been the greatest influence for you to get you to this point right now? So I think, um, so in the early days, undoubtedly, it's your parents. Um, and certainly my, my mother passed when I was young, so it was my father. Um, and I had a lot of experience with him and sat alongside him because he had his own business. And uh, because there was just me and him, my sister had gone off to uh, university. Then, um, you know, I used to go to the factory with him. I used to go out to visit customers with him. Um, you know, we had customers over to our house. We had his senior management team used to come over and have dinner at the house and stuff like that. So in the early days, it was that. Um, and then I, you know, I went into the music business and then I was in the film business, as you said, and TV and then uh, telecoms. And so, of course, your father can't be all things to, to you on every industry. So I think um, in, in my case, he was the bedrock. But then the, at every uh, few years, there's a fork in the road. And I think we all have them, right? It's like, do I stay in this job? Do I go after another job? Uh, do I pitch for that promotion? Do I go for the big sale or whatever it is? Or do I leave? 
actually. So there isn't really one conversation. It's an ongoing series of conversations as you approach a fork in the road. If it comes at you, you know, something happens and you've got to make a call then, <clears throat> I would say I, I trust my instincts pretty well, but I will still probably reach out proactively to a couple of people and get their input before, before making a final call, and you should always sleep on a decision. Hey, it's Riaz. Thanks for watching. For more conversations, click on subscribe and check us out online at everyconversationcounts.com. Alfred's a good man, so you know, I know this is gonna, you know, there's gonna be some dangerous stuff, so Alfred's gonna take that. So, <laughs> look alike. I'll tell you when I saw this.